Hi, John. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm not complaining. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on, bo on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are John Caputo. Well-known, uh, I don't know whether you call yourself a philosopher, a theologian, or both. You actually have a, you're, you're a professor emeritus of religion at Syracuse and of philosophy at Villanova. Do I have that right? That's right. I've never been quite able to make up my mind about whether I wanted to do philosophy or theology. And so when I, I, I chose to go into philosophy, but when I did, I ended up specializing in the philosophy of religion. Okay. And so I sort of move in the space between philosophy and religion, and ultimately, uh, I think when when all is said and done, they they sort of meet in the middle. I, I don't think that they are radically different from each other. Okay, so um, now you are associated with something called postmodern Christianity, and uh, which means you're associated with something called postmodernism, and. So probably right away, a number of people watching or listening to this are are um, worried that they may that they may not understand what's about to happen because I think some people scratch their heads about postmodernism. But I'm gonna I'm gonna try to uh, well I'm gonna try to learn more about it myself. I'm among those who's certainly not uh, deeply conversant in it, um, but I'm gonna try to make. Uh, your views, uh, you know, help you make them as clear as possible to a lay audience. Um, I should say you've written a whole bunch of books too. Uh, now, now, what some people may consider ironic in light of the fact that you're a postmodernist is you wrote a book called Truth, didn't you? <laughs> Turned out to be a pretty time, timely topic, didn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it did. So, um, so for starters, people probably heard. I mean, lately postmodernism has been in the news because people like Jordan Peterson condemn it as uh, being what's wrong with. America and the world. For starters, do you want to tell us if there are any like major misconceptions about it? I mean, I think a lot of people think of postmodernism as something that's like opposed to the idea of objective truth. Uh, and if not like anti science, kind of spending a certain amount of time undermining the credibility of science and so on. These are the kinds of things people think about postmodernism. Is that is that way off track? No, 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 that's exactly right. And most of my books are directed to that kind of argument. And, okay. Uh, and rebutting that kind of argument. Okay. Um, it's yeah. I mean, if you think of modernity, if you want to think about the postmodern, then you've got to start out with what you mean by modern, and um, the the sort of paradigm of modernity is uh, an ideal of pure objectivity, absolute certitude, uh, overarching a historical truth with a capital T. Now, that in, uh, actually served a purpose at one point, and that is back at the beginning of the mod modern era, of, of the Enlightenment, it was a fairly effective way to break up the power of the church and of uh, tradition and pave the way for modern emancipated thinking and modern democratic life. Uh, because it it shattered the uh, the the old absolutism of of the church and the king, but it ended up uh, in, in installing a new absolutism of pure reason. And um, what postmodernists say is, uh, I like to say that postmodernism is a continuation of what was started in modernity, which is let's say emancipation, but by another means. And that is, uh, eventually, at a certain point, we got to see that uh, tr truth, truth doesn't drop out of the sky, either sent either by God or by pure reason. Tr truth is something that we, we discover in the concrete, in ambiguous situations, in which um, what we mean by truth is the best interpretation available at the moment, keeping our fingers crossed, hoping it gets us through the day, knowing that tomorrow morning 
things may change. Now, I think that part is compatible with science as a lot of people see science, right? You, you, all you ever know is that you've got the most effective theory for the time being. That's right. I mean, in, in no small part, postmodern theory developed out of people working in the philosophy of science who, who saw that real science in practice is not this, the absolutistic illusion that we think it is. It is very much bound by instincts, by intuitions. When, when scientific ideas break through, they are at that moment unlikely. They're implausible, they're held in suspicion, they're doubted, they're ridiculed, and all the weight of evidence is on the old idea, the, what, what Kuhn called, Thomas Kuhn called the old paradigm. So what happens is, this, this expression, paradigm shifts, is that frameworks change, and they, at the moment of change, at the moment of crisis, they look highly implausible. And it's only because of the, uh, the resoluteness and the ingenuity and the creativity of the authors of the new paradigm that they succeed. So the, one of the more important predecessor figures of postmodernism is Thomas Kuhn, who wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, who said, look, instead of philosophizing about science, study the actual history of science and you'll discover that it is a lot of very concrete work on the ground, a lot of uh, seat of the pants thinking, which um, is very human. Very, uh, and he compared it to a political revolution. Right, and he also and he also said, I mean, to further kind of undermine the the, the most naive narrative about science, he noted that very often the new paradigm doesn't convince many people that the the adherence to the old paradigm go to their graves believing in it what has to happen is that new people are born who aren't in in, thrall, in the thrall of the old world view right so now let me ask you a big term you know I, i've i've uh, i've listened to to uh some of your lectures a big term for you and i gather in postmodern theory is deconstruction it, now, is it the case that uh, postmodernists uh, would see the decline of a, a paradigm, the blowing up of a paradigm, as part of an historical process of deconstruction? Yeah, sure. You would. And, and, and you see this in other realms too, right? You, in, in art, uh, a, a prevailing art paradigm will get deconstructed and give way to something else. And that's one of the markers, that, that's exactly right. And, and one of the things that happens in postmodern theory is instead of dividing things into the humanities and the sciences, you, you replace that distinction with a distinction between normal science or the reigning paradigm and the revolutionary one. And that distinction cuts across both science and the humanities. So you see things, you see pe figures in theology like Luther, in painting like Picasso, in science like uh, Einstein. You see exactly the same kind of pattern. You, you see an established paradigm, a moment of crisis, a revolutionary change. And that turns out to be a characteristic of human intelligence, which weakens the division between natural sciences and humanities. When Kuhn called, spoke of scientific revolutions, that was very scandalous because he was comparing it to a political revolution. Mm -hmm. And so they, his critics said, well, he's turning science over to mob rule. And, but, but in fact, what he was saying is, uh, you, you, human intelligence is, 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 is very similar, whether it's doing science or it's doing poetry or, or painting. There's a, a movement between normal and revolutionary. Paradigms get established, and once they're established, they hold on, and they should hold on. Mm -hmm. and they should hold on as long as they can, because otherwise there'll be chaos. Okay. If everything were revolutionary, there, there would just be chaos. Okay. Actually, James Joyce had a wonderful expression for this. He uses the expression chaosmos. Mm -hmm. So you have a moment, a moment of chaos, but it's only a moment. It's a moment in 
of disruption of the of the order of the cosmos, and that chaotic moment is what's creative. If there were only order, there would never be any progress. If there were only chaos, there would be only chaos. It's so, that, you know, modernism likes to think like that. It likes to weaken these oppositional categories. Mm-hmm. Um, it likes to think in terms of insight. Um, it, it weakens the notion of method and strengthens the notion of insight and creative breakthrough. Um, and this is, and so there's always a certain amount of questioning. Mm-hmm. So deconstruction is just one version of this. There, there are various versions of it. The, the one I like is deconstruction. It's the one that's most congenial to me. And that's saying every whatever has been constructed is deconstructible. To be deconstructible is not to simply destroy something or to or to uh, denounce its its value, but it's to it's to claim its reformability. It's like a law. It's one of the better examples, actually, of it. A, a law, if a law is not appealable and repealable, it becomes a monster. And that's true in art. It's true in science. It's true in religion. It's true in jurisprudence. It's true. Period. If something is not dynamic, if it's not reformable, if it's not able to reinvent itself, it becomes a monster. Mm -hmm. So the theory of deconstruction is a theory of protecting us against monsters. And and the other thing to remember about this word deconstruction is that um, the the notion of, of the deconstructible implies, by definition really, the notion of what's undeconstructible. So that there's always a certain kind of aspiration or hope for what we're what we're trying to do, what we're trying to get done, what's going on. Well, and and, and, can't be held captive by the present. Right, and and can I say, as I understand your theology, uh, this is an important part of uh, part of it. And I, I mean, maybe we should back up and say, as I understand your theology, one thing it involves. Focusing on the question of like what drives, guides, drives, energizes, whatever you want to say, the ongoing process of deconstruction, right? What what, what is the um, uh, and and ultimately you 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 start putting emphasis on a term, the unconditional, and and so on, and we'll we'll get to all that. Um, I want to. Um, and, and and it ultimately has to do with with our aspirations and our dreams and so on in a certain sense. Uh, right. And, and um, but but I want to pause and make sure we understand kind of uh, the process itself. This process of ongoing historical change. Now, I gather that deconstructionists, well, postmodernists, put put tremendous emphasis on language as a system and on the importance of language as a system. And one question I have is, am I to understand that in, in your world, in your view, language is in some sense fundamental? And and by that, I mean, to, to provide the context for that question, I mean, you know, there are, there is an op, uh, traditionally conceived of opposition between so-called idealists and materialists. You know, you have people who think that, like Marx, who think that, well, history, the fundamental drivers are like these material things, the facts on the ground, the economic relationships, the power dynamics. The ideas are just kind of reflections of what's going on on the ground. And then you have these idealists like Hegel who say, no, no, the ideas are more fundamental and what's going on on the ground is obedient to those. So I I guess I'm asking, do postmodernists posit the language as as having the kind of primary role that Marx might say materialist forces have or Hegel might say uh, ideas have. I, I, I'm pretty sure the answer is no, yeah. but I hope it'll be illuminating. Yeah, yeah. I would say yeah, the answer is no. Um, it, but it is the, like we, that's the notion that it is is called linguisticism. Okay. It, it's a kind of linguistic idealism, and it gives language a kind of uh, power that um, met- even metaphysical power that no no postmodern theorist uh, 
would, would, would give it. The, the objection is most pertinent to Derrida. It's not, per, it's not pertinent to other postmodernists who don't have the same kind of interest in language that he does. This man, Michel Foucault, for example, is much more interested in social systems than in language. Um, Gilles Deleuze is more interested in bodies and affectivity than in language. So it's it's not even true of postmodernism as such. It's just it's, it's an objection made particularly against deconstruction, and uh, I, I think it's unfair because I don't think. Now, now can you tell I, I us what it, what is the objection? Is the is the um that what the the position that language is um, what's is a is a is a power a kind of metaphysical power that's steering everything that it's dominant over economics it's do, it's dominant over bodily instincts it's 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 it's, it's called the, the objection is it's the construction is being accused of what's called linguistic idealism saying that the real what's really going on is going on in language and everything else is being steered by that whereas the opposite theory would be would be metaphysical or would be uh, linguistic material would be materialism which would say that language is an effect of history it doesn't it doesn't drive history now what I, the, the truth of the matter is this the the point of departure for uh, deconstruction is the study of language. It goes back to structural linguistics. So it, it actually began by studying what's going on in linguistic systems. And then it moved from there to say, aha, this is actually a feature of all of our experience. And the point of departure was to, was to, was to see that language is a system of differential relationships. So the word the words ring, king, sing are differentially related. We, 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 we understand them. They are significant in virtue of being discernibly different from each other. We, we, can, we can hear the difference. The discernible difference is what allows them to, to make meaning. And that, that's their, so it's a, it's a, they're phonic differences. Um, the, the way to, the way the easiest way to see this I found is when you look in a dictionary for the meaning of a word what you get are other words you, you, you never get the, the dictionary never says it's at any point throw the dictionary away and dive into the world that doesn't happen words are make sense in virtue of other words words uh, well, sentences are text inside of context and so at one point, Derrida said very, very infamously, there's nothing outside of the text. And everybody said, oh, this is linguistic idealism. He means the whole world is the only thing we know are the, is our own language and the meaning of our own words. He wasn't saying that. He was saying things are what they are in virtue of the system to which they belong. Everything is contextual. Physical, the, 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 the elements of uh, our body, the, the organs in our body are what they are in virtue of their relationship to other, the other parts of their body. Social systems are what they are in virtue of the, the various rankings of the social classes, my, the individual's role inside the class. You'll never find something that, that sits there absolutely in itself. Everything is contextual. So it isn't that language is primary, it's that it's paradigmatic. It, 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 is that... Uh, That's right. And, it, and, and what could prove that any better than the talk, right, uh, than th this information society that we belong to right now, where we speak in terms of programs and information systems and artificial intelligence. Uh, what artificial intelligence has discovered is, theory has done, is go back to the, to the brain as a neural network. Intelligence is a, is a way that elements inside of a network communicate with each other. So that's proving to be a general paradigm for what, what deconstruction says is that this model which we learn from language is in fact a general model for everything. And um, 
that means that everything is relational. It doesn't mean everything is relativistic. It means that everything is relational. So, uh, and so the, 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 the task is to know how to interpret what's going on, how this, this element is working inside the system. To understand something is to be able to, 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 to contextualize it in just the same way that understanding a sentence is a matter of contextualizing it. Mm -hmm. Now, one one thing that, that people might find ironic here is that, um, on the one hand, you're saying kind of the study of language uh, for postmodernists uh, provided the model that, when applied to other aspects of reality, seemed to make sense. But on the other hand, the way you were describing uh, the view of change generally, like a, a scientific paradigm uh, kind of it enters a crisis and or decomposes deconstructs and, and you get a new one uh, and s same with a movement in art or or with uh, you know religion in, in the uh, at the dawn of the Reformation and so on that doesn't seem so obviously true of language you know what I mean I mean language evolves in a more continuous at least in terms of the words we use and what they mean language evolves in a more incremental and continuous way than any of that, doesn't it? Yeah, the history of, that's true of the history of language, that, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. What, what's, um, so you, you, you're, you're extending a figure here. I mean, what's important, the, the, the parallel in language itself would be what you call, what Wittgenstein called language games. So there, there are realms of discourse which uh, have sort of have their own rules, like like the like the the, the language game of uh, in just the same way that chess is different from football. Uh, there are different language games in inside of our in our discursive universe. So, what are a couple um, of language games? Is science a language game? Is Science is a language game. Yeah, a language game doesn't mean a natural language. It's not distinguishing French from German. It's distinguishing the language game of of, of science, the language game of art. Now, the, and then the breakthrough uh, for religion is that it establishes uh, religion as its own language game. That is to say, it's it's a way. It, it's a discursive form that allows us to make sense in the same way that science has its own discursive form that allows it to make sense, or history, or poetry. Same thing's true of religion. Religion has its own uh, form of life. Okay, that's a good transition. So to get back to uh, the religious aspect of your worldview, uh, this idea of like uh, postmodern um, Christianity, uh, the, uh, so a question arises again, um, well, let's look at the, the question that arises in traditional Christianity and biblical Christianity. You know, history is happening. These stuff happens. What is guiding it? What is the point? What is the, you know, is, is it being, uh, is it being drawn teleologically to some future? Uh, was there a prime mover that set it in motion or both the case? Did the, I mean, and Christianity's in, in traditional Christianity's, I would say biblical Christianity's idea is, both are yes. There was a prime mover who set it in motion with an end in mind. So there is a purpose to history. It's heading somewhere intelligible, and there's a reason. So uh, it seems to me that there is something that your inquiry has in common with that, right? I mean, you, you're looking at history as postmodernists might depict it as you have these, these systems that seem stable, and then they change. Uh, new systems arise in these various realms, art, science, religion itself, that's history, social structure, presumably, that collectively, that's history. And I think you're asking the question, well, what is, what is guiding or drawing or inspiring the process of deconstruction, right? The, because deconstruction is the process of history as you see it. It's systems continue to get deconstructed, new ones arise, then they get deconstructed. And then you want to ask the question, what is the, what's beneath the deconstruction more fundamentally? What guides, inspires, whatever, energizes? That is that is that much true about what no, you're that, doing? That's quite right, yeah, that's good.
And so then what is your answer? My answer is, I, I, I like the, this expression which you used uh, earlier on, the notion of something unconditional. So uh, it, the, way, the way I like to divide things up or to articulate them is to distinguish between something of unconditional value or importance or worth or desirability and the conditional forms in which it's enacted or constructed. So what the conditional is always deconstructible. It's always constructed and therefore deconstructible in virtue of some kind of unconditional aspiration or desire uh, or dream. The mythological form that takes is the, a sort of mythological theology of history, that, that, which began, you know, with with uh, a, a, a story of our, of our first parents in the Garden of Eden, and moves to to a climax in the uh, the culmination of world history, where God will establish His reign. Well, all of that I take to be a symbolic way of, of saying something that's that's important but something that would be uh, diminished if you literalized it. You would, you would have turned it into a kind of fable or fairy tale or superstitious bit of magic. But, but I take it to be saying something that's, that's interesting and important if you read it well, if you interpret it properly and don't literalize it. So I'm trying to say there's something... Uh, Something important going on in religion that um, we, we sort of have to protect religion from itself. You know, we have to protect religion from literalizing and absolutizing uh, and confusing the uh, its unconditional aspiration with the conditional form in which it takes shape. The way it, in a particular book or a particular tradition or a particular story. So what, um, so, I mean, I know you, 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 you wind up saying that like, uh, if, if, you, if you ask, uh, you know, the unconditional, I think, is your answer to what, what kind of motivates or draws uh, this process of deconstruction. And, and so uh, I think immediately people are going to ask, uh, before we ask you to elaborate a little on what you mean by the unconditional, and here I think things will get challenging probably because you're getting to a pretty fundamental metaphysical level, but I, I, I think people will ask, so are you equating the unconditional with God, with the divine? It, 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 does this correspond to what in, in uh, biblical Christian, traditional Christianity is just called God? In religion, the unconditional goes under the name of God. Okay. okay. So that... So, the, so, so God is the unconditional, but the unconditional is not God, because the unconditional is operative wherever human beings are trying to be human, wherever, they're, wherever they have desires and aspirations, uh, it, which may or may not include the notion of God. The notion of God is... The, the way the word, the, the way the un, what I call the unconditional shows up in religion is God. And, and in the monotheistic, even then, you have to restrict it to the monotheistic religions. Uh, because there are, there are traditions that we call religion in our Christian Latin word religion, we call them religion, that, you know, don't even ha don't have that word, they don't have any good translation for that word, and they don't use the notion of God, like, Buddhism, for example, or they have many gods, uh, and so so they could th things could be the, the, in the study of religion today. The word religion is put in scare quotes because it's a it's a Western Latin Christian. Primary the word itself is a Western Latin Christian. So, you you've used the word aspiration. Um, or, or, you know, dream, and, and you're putting a lot of emphasis on, on our, our, as I understand it, our aspirations. What are the things humans aspire to? What are the things they dream? And you seem to be associating that with the unconditional. And I guess I have a couple of questions. One, are you saying that that, that, that is a, uh, that that's a manifestation of the, the 
unconditional? In other words, is, is that, you know, to you, to switch the terminology, would you say that's a manifestation of the divine? That if, if I have an aspiration, a dream, if I, if I think about the future and want it to be a certain way, is that a, that's a manifestation of the unconditional or that's what drives the unconditional or it's the other way around, the unconditional drives that? What, what, is, the, what is the relationship between the unconditional and, and human aspiration? Uh, well, on the, sub, on the side of the subject, on the side of the desiring self, they're the same thing. But what, my, my deepest, most profound concerns as a uh, person uh, is a matter of unconditional interest or concern or importance or value to me. But that's not to say that it's all something subjective, because uh, I'm in fact responding to something that is, is on the objective side, is on the side of, of, of the reality itself. So there's an unconditional qual quality in reality itself. There's an unconditional quality beyond my individual self in the, the social whole, the social good. And there's an unconditional quality about the universe, which gives it um, the, the, the unconditional and the objective side is people, a lot of times people use the expression there's something bigger than us okay well that's the unconditional that's, that's this thing which was there before us and will be there long after us which is um, absolutely primordial one philosopher back in the 19th century a German ph philosopher named Schelling used a wonderful expression he called it the unpre- thinkable. The, the thing that thought can never get behind, it can never get there, it, it got there first. And thinking is always sort of trying to uh, catch up to it, to, to, to get there. So on the objective side, there's something, uh, 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 is an unconditional reality that we'll never quite catch up to, which mm -hmm. will preceded thought. And if the scientists are right about the future of the universe just expanding into oblivion it'll be long it'll be there long after thought this disappears um, there's so there's an unconditional being or reality that precedes us mm -hmm. uh, on the objective side and on the subjective side there's our own unconditional what we hold to be of unconditional importance okay so, so the unconditional is unconditional because its existence and nature are not conditioned on anything we do or even on anything that happens in the world we observe. Yeah, well, think of it like, you know, it's sort of like the, the, the kids who, when, when the kids, kids are growing up, they keep asking why, 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 why. Well, the, ultimately, there's this thing which is without why. Right, you know, right. Which is the point, what, what, what it's, you care it, about. It's turtles so, all the way down until the unconditional, as the old... Uh, Sure. You, yeah. you hit a presupposition that you, you just, there's no answer. There's no, uh, Aristotle says at one point, the mark of education, he uses the word paideia, we get, we get pedagogue from that word. The mark of an educated person is to know when to stop asking questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, because you hit that point, which is... So is this related to what uh, the theologian uh, Paul Tillich called the ground of being? In, in, as I said at the beginning, I'm interested, I never quite could make up my mind whether I want to do theology or philosophy. Mm -hmm. the, the theologian who makes the most sense to me is Paul Tillich, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the philosopher who makes the most sense to me is this man, Jacques Derrida, who formulated uh, what got to be known as deconstruction. And what's interesting about both of them is that they're their focus ultimately settles on the same word, unconditional. The difference being that in Tillich, this really is theology. He really thinks it's the ground of being, the unconditional is God. Whereas for Derrida, Derrida, you know, is a postmodern philosopher. He's not so sure that we know anything metaphysical, uh, but he thinks that the unconditional is something that... Uh, draws us, something that uh, lures us, but he's not prepared to say that it's God or the universe or anything else. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. 
uh, whereas from that point of view, Tillich would be more like a modern thinker because mm -hmm. he really thinks there's an ontological foundation for all this. Derrida, as a postmodern who is a little wary of coming up with the big answers, doesn't know. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he thinks that we can, t he thinks the notion of the unconditional is inescapable. Whether it's God or the universe or biology or whatever it is, he doesn't know. He can't, he can't say. But he does think that it's a feature of our, an indelible feature of our experience, mm -hmm. or so, our encounter with the world. Okay, so um, so to get back to this question of the connection between the, uh, between the unconditional and our own aspiration, um, you know, I, and to frame it in the context of the notion of teleology, another, telos, in other words, the idea that there is a larger purpose uh, to the kind of historical process in which we're embedded, which is a... Well, you may not think that. I mean, you would still have a notion of the unconditional and not think that at all. No, but if but but you you may but 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 I gather that in 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 um, well my question is in in in, in postmodern Christianity is the idea that um, that what you know aspiration I mean when you think of you, you know uh, telos the idea of uh, something moving toward a purpose can exist at different levels. In a certain sense, it uncontroversial exists at a human level in the sense that we conceive of goals and we pursue them. So we imagine, you know, I imagine that I want to eat this, this macaroni. I go buy it. I eat it. There's a sense in which I was being drawn into the future by my ability to conceive it. There's a sense in which that's teleological, but, but in the, in the, so my aspiration has an uncontroversial Kind of micro telos in it, but then the, but then the, the it, religion. Some religions raise the question of whether there's a larger telos at work, and all of history is subordinate to some goal. And I guess I'm asking: is 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 with postmodern Christianity is the answer yes, and the key mechanism somewhere in this connection between the unconditional and individual human aspiration. No, I don't. I, I see. I, that's why I, I said that I don't think that you're ten, you're bound to any kind of es any kind of teleological notion of history. I mean, the, as far as we can tell, the best information we have available, this civilization of ours, and this Earth, and this solar system, and this galaxy, are headed for oblivion. That, that's a, an astronomy. That was unavailable to antiquity. Uh, the Saint Paul thought that the world consisted mostly in uh, in, in uh, the Middle East and 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 uh, the a Asia Minor, and then way out on the limits of the universe was this place that we call Spain, which he was hoping to get to before the end time came and God established His rule. And he thought the, the uh, stars were eternal, and he thought the Earth was in the middle, and the, the scriptures were written in a uh, completely different world, right? And then there was this man, Bultmann, who came along in the 20th century and said, look, if you want to understand the scriptures, you've got to get rid of the old astronomy that they, they had and, and understand that after you've done that, that there's still something there. So the notion of a, an end of history, when God would come and establish his rule on earth forever, Earth is, is going to be here forever. The Earth has got about 500 million years in it left or so, and, and then that will be that. So I don't think that there is uh, any such thing as historical teleology, that history uh, has some telos that is by which it is divinely, towards which it is divinely guided. I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that's the mythical form in which it's found in the scriptures, but I don't think that that's true. What I think is the, the scriptures are telling us stories about something important in our lives, 
and they're to be read the way you would read literature. When you read uh, a great novel, uh, it's telling you something important, deeply true, but it's in the fiction section of the library. And I think that the scriptures are like that. You, you'd have to put them in the literature section of, of the library, in the religious literature section, but they're literature. And they're saying something important. But what they're not doing is giving us a picture of the universe. The people who wrote them were not cosmologists. They didn't know anything about the nature of the universe. They were not historians. They didn't know anything about the history of the human race. And they had no basis whatsoever to talk about the end and the purpose of the human race. But they were still saying something that's important. So I don't, I didn't have no, I don't subscribe to any teleological notion of history. I mean, and, 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 what's the most concise formulation of what they were saying that's important? Well, depending on who you were talking about, the prophets, the most important thing the prophets were talking about was justice, the rule of, rule of justice. Uh, in some of the older books of the scriptures, what the, the most important thing they were established, interested in was establishing the rule of uh, the people of God, of, of, of Israel, of Yahweh, and of making sure that nobody messed with Yahweh, or they'd be sorry. Mm -hmm. So they, that was a very nationalistic uh, idea of uh, what, what we call their religion. But it evolved, and when you, by the time you get to the prophets, um, then they're starting to think in terms of uh, universal justice, the messianic age, peace. Mm -hmm. And um, in the New Testament, you see the, it's the prophetic stream of the, uh, Christian, of the Jewish scriptures which shows up in the New Testament under the notion of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is an amazing place, right? It's a, it's a place where where hatred is greeted with love, hostility with forgiveness, the weak are uh, the, the meek in, inherit the earth, uh, the 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 ver everything's upside down. It's a it's a topsy turvy world. So it's a po it's it's a poetic vision of life that philosophers themselves would be less inclined would be would not come up with. Mm -hmm. Philosophers would think in terms of an order of an order established by rational uh, agreement and rational consensus. Whereas, what you see in the scriptures is a is a much more uh, poetic vision of life, a, a much crazier vision of life. It's a, it's sort of uh, an Alice in Wonderland, topsy turvy uh, life, where. The last are first, and the outsiders are, in, are, are invited in, and the insiders are invited out, and the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It's a, it's a radical vision of, uh, a revolutionary vision of, uh, of life. Okay. That's, that's I think, uh, the, the story it's telling. That's its, uh, its vision, and it's impossible vision, right? You can't can't run a railroad like that, but it's a vision that interrupts the way we do tend to run our railroads. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you why I asked the question about teleology. I was listening to one of your lectures. You were talking about this uh, process of kind of repeated deconstruction that, that uh, in a way, um, constitutes a lot of what we mean by history. And you asked the question, these are not, I was, I was taking notes, these aren't quite direct quotes, but you were asking, when you ask what, uh, what drives the process, you, you were asking questions like, uh, what is calling to us? What are we called by, right? You put things in terms of calling, beckoning, as if, being, as if you're being beckoned into the future. And of course, if you look at the prevailing non-teleological view of history, in the world today, which is basically science, maybe scientific materialism, adherents of that view would say, why are you even asking questions like what is calling to us? They would say, look, it's, it's, it's uh, everything that happens is a result of prior causes. So that, you know, the, the it's, things are just being pushed into the future. They're not being pulled anywhere. That's kind of the standard non-teleological 
framework, but you're using uh, clearly different language than a scientist would, would use to when you ask what is driving the process. And the language seems to be about, I mean, first of all, the, the word calling is itself suggestive in a religious context because of this notion that we all have some role to play, right? That's divinely, uh, that originates in the divine in some sense. Um, but, but also it's just, it, there is this idea of being called into the future, right? So, uh, and that to me is suggestive of, 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 of teleology, right? You can see, you can see where I'm coming from. Yeah. But with, but without some notion of, of an ultimate telos that's drawing everything, both nature and, and humanity forward. I mean, I mean, look at science. Science is, is, is goal driven. It's, 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 it's driven by scientific projects. And right now, it's driven, it's riven and driven by the goal of a unified theory. So scientific work would not uh, happen were, were they not puzzled by conflicts and anomalies and difficulties and problems um, which they're trying to resolve. Um, that's not to say that human science is the goal of the universe. It's to say that our our life is in denying some that we we could in any way know or posit some ultimate talos. I'm not denying uh, something that's very important to me, and that is the notion of our futuricity of of the futural nature of human existence. We are. Uh, unfinished beings. We are open-ended beings. And deconstruction is the theory of keeping us unfinished, keeping us open, and not letting things free, freeze over or, or encrustate. It's a, it's a theory of decrustation, de, uh, you know, breaking up the crust to keep the, keep the future open. So you think in terms of potentialities, renewal, reinvention, and that's going on in science every bit as much as, and maybe more so these days, uh, as uh, everything else. Okay, so I guess then the way I would frame the question is, it's true that scientists are drawn into, toward what they're doing by these conceptions in their head, these aspirations, they want a unified theory and that motivates them to pursue one. And it, it doesn't really exist. It's kind of out there in some sense, and they're being drawn toward it. And we all have our goals that we're being drawn toward. And so in that sense, even a scientist might uh, say, sure, you can talk about like what is calling me, you know, away from the existing paradigm. And thus what is calling me to help deconstruct the existing paradigm. They would they would embrace that language, but I think a, a, a hardcore scientific materialist would say, but if you want to ask more fundamentally what is driving the process, I would just, uh, I, I would use uh, more reductionistic language that is more about uh, just, just traditional causal things. In other words, I would point you to the parts of my brain that are moving when I see, think of myself as looking into the future. So. In, so, so in other words, I, I guess I'm just saying, if you say to them, well, where does this aspiration come from? Scientists are going to give you one kind of answer. You're providing a different kind of answer because your answer is the unconditional, right? And, and, and I now see that it's not necessarily a teleological answer you're providing, but it's a very different answer. It's a metaphysical answer or something, right? Well, uh, yes, it's a philosophical answer. That is, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's I'm not trying to talk about the universe as if we were dead, and all, all that were all that all that's out there are quantum phenomena. I'm trying to talk about philosophy, I think, and theology. That's why I think they ultimately come together. Uh, are, are trying to describe our relationship to the world, what what it's like for us to to be in the world, our being in the world, our form of life. So, so the, our encounter with reality. The, the natural sciences are trying to exp, are trying to describe reality as if we were not there, as if we were dead or never born, which, which is basically what we mean by objectivity. Right? Get us out of the picture and just take a look at everything as if we weren't there. Um, 
mean, what I'm saying is not the least bit inconsistent with that. I mean, if if there were something in the in the sciences which said that the sorts of neural beings, neurophysiological, biochemical beings that we are, is inconsistent with this aspirational quality that I'm describing, then I would be worried. But I don't. I don't see that. I, I, I think that when you look at um, not like a 19th century mechanistic reductionist, but like a 21st century uh, scientist, when you look at us, what you what you see is an extremely mobile, complex, plastic uh, being that is. Uh, enormously creative and adaptable um, and reinventable. And I don't think that's at odds with neuroscience. I think that that's one of the, one of the things that neuroscience says. The, the word plastic is not uh, a word I take from deconstruction. It's a word I take from neuroscience. Um, we're, right. we're, we're reinventable beings. And that means that we're, we're constantly exposed, uh, we, we are exposed to a future which uh, could be quite dangerous, this is why I don't have any theological view of things, uh, our exposure to the future could be the self-destructive, and from the looks of things, it is right now. I mean, if we're, uh, if we keep doing what we're doing and keep going where we're going, our, our creative intelligence is going to destroy us. Uh, and destroy the, the, our habitat. Um, but I don't think that, that my notion of openness, uh, exposure to the future, is in any way at odds with neuroscience or uh, the natural sciences. Okay, I, I guess, uh, I mean, I think that's an interesting question you could pursue. I think, I guess at a minimum, I'd be saying, you know, if you ask... Uh, if you say to a scientist that I, th I think the, the answer to the question of where our aspirations kind of come from, what, you know, th that in some sense, the answer to that is the unconditional. I think the average scientist would say, A, a what are you talking about? B, why are you even looking in that category for the answer? Well, well, that's why you need the notion of language games. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't speak all the language games at once, but, you, at the, but they ought not to be islands isolated from each other in such a way that they can't communicate or you can't cross from one to the other. But it, it is one thing to speak in the language of uh, what, what philosophers call phenomenology. Phen phenomenology is an attempt to describe our experience as such. And that's important. If science couldn't do that, it wouldn't know what it was studying. You know, it, it would just be studying phenomena that it wouldn't be able to relate to the world and, and to life. They wouldn't... They, they, the scientists start in the same place we all do with with the world we experience, and then they put on, uh, they adopt a set of uh, an intellectual framework and an experimental framework in virtue of which they can look more more deeply into it. Uh, but what they're looking more deeply into is the world we live in, and. I'm saying, so, so, and, and we have different languages for those two, for, for, for those two, I don't say two different worlds, but two different perspectives. Science, science is a certain way of thinking, it's a certain interpretation of things. Um, and by, when I say interpretation, I don't mean it's just an idle opinion, I mean it's, a, it's got an angle on things, and that angle is genuine. But the, the angle of ordinary experience, uh, of the world we live in, uh, the, what, what philosophers call the life world is just as important. If you, if you didn't have it, <laughs> to you, you, all, all you'd have would be, 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 be uh, electrochemical processes going on. So, so I think these languages are, are compatible. But if I were speaking as a scientist, I would not use the word unconditional. Or it's, you know, it does, doesn't belong to that language game. It's like uh, it's like calling. Um, checkmate in football. It, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean that there's not a sense of which checkmate makes sense. And football has, there are different rules. There are different, different 
they're different ways of thinking. They're different perspectives. They're different. That's why I, I'm interested in what's called hermeneutics, theories of interpretation. And there are multiple modes of of, of interpretation, multiple frameworks. Um, that's part of the plasticity of our intelligence. We can adopt multiple frameworks. We're not locked into any given framework. The the the, the multiplicity of frameworks, which postmodernism celebrates is testimony to our intelligence. It's not a defect. It's not a, a weakness. The capacity to speak many languages is not a defect. It's a, it's a gift. Okay. L- let me let me ask. so 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 I guess d- to say um, in the language of postmodern Christianity, as I understand it, my aspirations in turn, in some sense, derive or draw draw some kind of vital energy from this thing called the unconditional, uh, that bears some comparison to uh, a more traditionally theologically minded Christian saying, uh, my aspirations are guided by God. Um, And so I guess uh, uh, my question for you, it's a little uh, personal, is um, how do your, I mean, do you consider yourself an adherent of postmodern Christianity? If so, how does it shape your life? How, how does it, uh, you know, how does it frame your life? Well, I have, um, I grew up in a conservative uh, Roman Catholic world. And I was, I spent uh, four years as a young man in a Catholic religious order. And so I have a deep, uh, and then I left in order to, I left the order in order to study philosophy. Uh, and when I began to study philosophy, I discovered that I hadn't left. <laughs> I was still uh, taken, struck, seized by the same questions. Um, and so the Christian world and the, this vision of the kingdom of God in the New Testament has always uh, held me captive. The difference being that at a certain point I realized um, that it's not uh, what I thought it was. That is, it's not a body of propositions that represent an objective state of affairs in in history or in the world. It's a uh, it's a prov- it's a provocation. It's a siren call. It's a um, uh, a proclamation of a way to be that lures us. It's losing its lure, and that's mostly because of it's, a, it's its own fault, I think, because it's literalized itself. It's turned itself, it's contracted itself into a book among the fundamentalists or, inst- or into an institution among uh, the, my own tradition, the Catholic tradition. Um, and I have no confidence that it will survive because it's, I, I think it's been so self-destructive that I don't know that it can survive. But but is the role it played a role that has to get played by something if society yeah. is to be a good place? Yeah, I think so. I think that it's more and more being taken over by literature and art uh, because the it's made itself unbelievable, and the so the role it's abdicating its role. It's falling down on its job. And on one hand, it's been that role has been uh, the baton has been passed to art and literature, and on the other hand, to uh, social activists, to people who have a concern for justice in the streets. And um, that's okay. I mean, if that happens, so be it. Um, but I, I do think that when that happens, if and when that were to happen, it would be it would be the transcription of certain. Um, stories that would still be in our collective unconscious that would be taking new forms. But, um, but yes, I think, so, see, here's the thing. Um, if you think, we are historical beings. We, we belong to an historical moment. That means that we have an enormous uh, collective memory, uh, a storehouse of... Um, ideas and aspirations and hopes and dreams that um, have been left unfilled, unfulfilled. And so you say, where does the unconditional come from? It, 
it comes from the past. It comes from our inherited traditions. There are, we, we use words of elemental power that, are, that have never been actualized. When we use a word like justice, it's, a, it's an ancient word, and it it's goes in our tradition, it goes all the way back to the Jewish prophets, and, and it probably came, they probably got it from somewhere else. And it's a word uh, that, that comes to us from time immemorial, and it holds a promise of a future that we can't see coming, we can't imagine. It's a word of elemental uh, promise. So, wh where, 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 uh, our notion of the unconditional is always the, uh, as unconditionally something or other. It's, a, it's, it's the unconditional that's inspired, that comes to us from the tradition that, it, that is handed down uh, these uh, gifts. So, so uh, but at this point, I think I need you to reconcile something because, on the one hand, you're saying the unconditional has been, in some sense, shaped by our heritage, as I understand it. But I thought I heard you say the unconditional is exists independent of anything happening in our world or anything in the world we see. Yeah, that's probably too strong the way I put it. The unconditional would never exist except in the concrete conditions in which it emerges. I mean, the unconditional. The unconditional. Put it this way: the unconditional is not a being. It's not a thing. There's a certain quality in things. And so that when we encounter a particular thing, a whole world can open up for us. And Marcel Proust, you know, with mm -hmm. the, the, the cup of tea and the, and the little uh, cookie, uh, opened up the whole world of his childhood. Mm -hmm. a, a painter can do a painting of an isolated object, and an entire world opens up from it. So there is an unconditional quality in everything, e e even the most mundane things. You know, an old uh, piece of clothing that belonged to your father, who is now long dead, okay, becomes infinitely precious, right? infinitely precious. There's an unconditional quality in everything. There's a certain uh, e evocation uh, of something of unconditional worth in, in everything. So so you could you could say the, to reverse what, the way we've been putting it, the unconditional is the effect of all right. these conditioned things that are around us. The, the, the conditional and the unconditional belong together. The, the, the conditioned things around us are expressing something and reaching for something unconditional in just the same way that the unconditional only comes to be in the things around us. So is the unconditional always something of infinite value in some sense, or, or? Yes, it's the thing. It's the that then which there is no which, or, you know, in any given order. It's 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 the, it's the point where you stop and you say, "This is without why. You know, but, why are you course, doing this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that?" There's a certain point where you say, <laughs> "Because." But most, what, the, most, most of the things I see in my environment right now, I don't consider to be of infinite value. Are you saying there is a vantage point somewhere in principle from which they would be seen yes. as of infinite value? That's right. A poet, a painter, a novelist can take the most mundane things and turn them into, make them infinitely significant. I mean, it could be infinitely ominous, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be infinitely good. So enlightenment, mm -hmm. enlightenment would involve seeing the unconditional in everything. Yeah, if you could do that. You'd be in good shape. If you, if you could see an unconditional quality, I, I think that's what when you say enlightenment. That's that's a, it's not a word I use a lot, but it's it's a good one. And yeah, that's what enlightenment would be. It would be this the power, the insight into the unconditional quality in any thing around us, any finite re reality around us. Yeah. I think that's, see, that's what I think we are. I think human beings have this uh, capacity to open things up and 
it's dangerous when you open things up because it's much it's safer to keep them in place and settled. But we have a capacity to imagine things and open them up in um, unlimited ways. I, I mean, I, I say unlimited, I, 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 I don't mean absolutely unlimited. I mean uh, unlimited within our framework. If we spoke a different language, lived in a different world, uh, so we're surrounded by a different uh, geography. What we were, what we would be reinventing would be, you know, would be in, in, would belong to that order. Um, you think about uh, uh, one time, um, the Derrida, Jacques Derrida, was uh, being interviewed, and uh, they said, "What is it uh, you really want?" You know. <laughs> what, what, you, the author of Deconstruction, what is what is undeconstructible for you? And he said, this is very early in his life when he was quite interested in literature. And he said, I would like to write something, he wrote in French, I would like to write, write something absolutely untranslatable that would be so idiomatically French, so perfectly French, that you couldn't translate it. We just, the translator would just despair. Right. Well, that's, you can't do that. If you could ever do that, it wouldn't be French anymore. It wouldn't be any language at all. It would, wouldn't be a word. So the very thing you're trying to do can't be done. And the undeconstructible is like that. It's, it's actually, it's impossible. The conditions under which it's possible make, make it impossible to do things like that. So in poet, you could say, well, a poem is like that. The, the poet is trying to write something so, uh, so idiomatic that it's untranslatable. So there's, a, there's an undeconstructible in the order of poetry. There's an undeconstructible in the order of justice, in the political order. Just, justice is, is undeconstructible. We're, we're constantly constructing laws that reach for justice, that remember justice, that, that promise justice, but will never quite be just. So the undeconstructible ha has attained a kind of perfection in some realm, but th th that is not exactly the same as the um, the unconditional, because that 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 precedes it. That exists regardless. Now the undeconstructible and the unconditional for me. So here, that, that's good. That's the difference between Tillich and and, and Derrida. For for Tillich, who is a theologian, the undeconstructible. Well, he doesn't use that word. The unconditional really is um, the ground of being. It, it really is God. Um, he is theologian. Whereas there, I would say, well, no, you know, the unconstructible is um, in any given construction, there's some undeconstructable, um, in any given order, there's something undeconstructible that is evoked by that concrete construction. So he wouldn't say it's, he wouldn't say it's there no matter what, because he, he wouldn't talk like that. He, he's, he, wouldn't, he doesn't have a, an ontology. He actually, <laughs> so Derrida likes to play with words, and uh, so he says instead of an ontology, he's constructing a hauntology. Now, a, a haunt, a, a specter, a ghost that's... Uh, we're sort of haunted by the undeconstructible. It's not a it's not a ground of being. It's a ghost. It spooks us. And he um, he uses Shakespeare for this. He has he does an analysis of of Hamlet of the ghosts in Ham of the ghost in Hamlet. It spooks us. It haunts us. It provokes us. It make, it, it uh, it's uh, un unheimlich. The Germans say it's spooky. Um, Whereas there, Telic thinks really it's the ground of being. It's, it's God. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's, and I'm closer to Derrida than to Telic on that point. Okay. So one more question. I assume that it's just a linguistic coincidence that the unconditional is a very important fundamental term in in this in this theology, referring to a kind of absolute. And that in Buddhism, the unconditioned is a very fundamental, important term referring to a kind of absolute. There's no, is that just kind of a coincidence so far as you know? 
No, I mean, I think that's that's what they have in common. That's what they, they have in common. But I mean, it's, they, there's they no don't have deep... gods in common. They don't have sacraments in common. They don't have, you know, they're not they're not. There's not a genus called religion of which they're species, but they do share that feature. But I mean, there's no. It's just a coincidence that those two terms sound alike. There's there's no deep like analytically. It isn't like your unconditional. It has a lot of things in common with the Buddhist unconditioned. I I don't think I, I think that the similarities are real and not coincidental. Mm. But I don't know what the word would be for unconditioned in um, the, the Buddhist text and the ancient Sanskrit text. I don't know if they've got a word like that. Well, I think I, I think it is sometimes uh, compared to. I mean, the term conditioned is used in in Buddhism, kind of roughly corresponds to the term cause to condition something is cause something so the unconditioned is kind of beyond the realm of causality and and and, and that's why uh you make contact with it when you reach nirvana because you have escaped the realm of uh of causal forces by virtue of no longer uh responding to the lure of pleasure or the push of aversion you know you've become you've transcended the realm of ordinary human causal motivation and you make contact with this realm yeah yeah so it's not a, that's it's not it's not a it's not merely a coincidence that in english we use the the same word for both to describe both traditions uh, I would say, though, that both Christianity and the deconstruction of Christianity, both deconstruction and Christianity, are they have a very different conception of time and, and contingency and, and, and temporal flow and individuality. You know, they, they don't think of them at all as any kind of veil or appearance or uh, illusion that, that you need to transcend. The, no, the, although, although Paul Paul did say we view the world through a glass darkly, right? As if uh, once you enter the kingdom of heaven, things will be clearer. But uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's the way he got traditionally. What, what he meant was eventually God's going to come down here and set yeah. things up, and then yeah. we'll see clearly. He didn't mean we we're going to go to heaven. He meant God was going to come down to earth and establish the, His rule, and that'll be the end of the Romans on earth, and then we'll see clearly. That, that's what he thought. And he thought it was going to happen soon. And he was trying to get the word out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rushing around the ancient world, trying to get the word out that his prophet, his Messiah, his anointed one, has arrived yep. and announced that the kingdom is at hand. And you better get ready. And, right. and they really thought it was a matter of m months, a year, a yeah. couple of years. And one of the reasons that the scriptures, the, the Christian scriptures, were not written until 30 or 40 years after the death of Jesus was that they finally realized that this was going to be a longer haul than they thought. They thought they didn't write the, anything down because they didn't think there was anything that they didn't think anybody was going to be around to read them. Right. You know, they were not, the, the world was about to be, history was about to be consummated. Well, it's still here. Uh, <laughs> well, that's right. So then they decided to write it down. That's, and then at a certain point, uh, more progressive theologians said, yeah, it's really not a story about something that's going to happen in time. It's not, it's not telling us, it's not predicting the end of history. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually doing something else. Mm -hmm. And that, that would be to take a more postmodern view of Christianity. I might say, by the way, uh, that the word postmodern is itself being eclipsed as as we speak and, and probably has been, and it's being uh, the, the 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 word that's in place now that's taking over is posthuman. Post what? Posthuman. Post -human. So we're now we're now entering a, a period of what is sometimes called transhumanism. Right, I've heard that which will be consummated, you know, with all this eschatology in the post-human, which will be that point at which human intelligence is extricated from its biological basis. Mm -hmm. And we really won't be rational animals anymore. We'll just be 
uh, intelligent systems. Assuming we ever were rational animals. Yeah, that's right. So, so people always say to me, "Well, you know, you talk about postmodern. What com- what comes after postmodernism?" Yeah. And well, the answer is posthumanism. That is the advent of artificial intelligence, um, artificial intelligence supplements to uh, human uh, to both body and mind, mm-hmm. and then eventually, and this is not science fiction. I mean, these are absolutely serious people who are, you know, this movie Transcendence with yeah, Johnny yeah. Depp two or three years ago. Yep. No, there are. I know some of these people. It's, uh, we all have our religions, I guess. Uh, well, you remember uh, what we were saying before, that the first time a new a breakthrough occurs in any field, and, and, and certainly science, the first reaction to it is, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't rule out, I don't rule out various exotic futures, including oblivion. Uh, which it isn't that exotic, actually. But uh, I- I'm open to these. Well, listen, we've uh, th- we've given people plenty to ponder. I think. I mean, I could probably uh, go back and listen to a recording of this and come up with a whole another set of questions. But I, I think, think I'm so. about out. And I really appreciate your taking the time. Uh, are there any particular resources of yours you would steer people to? Particular books, or uh, I don't know, websites or anything. The the book that probably relates to what we've been saying uh, most directly is uh, a book called, well, I'd say two books. One is a book simply called Hermeneutics, mm-hmm. and then the subtitle is Facts and Interpretation in the Age of Information. And that, that'll cover a lot of the sort of epistemological questions we've been debating. But the book that uh, in which I sort of work out what, how I think this all plays out in religion is simply called On Religion. Hmm. And I just published a, a second edition of it uh, this past year, which brings in this question that we were just talking about, uh, about transhumanism. Mm-hmm. Okay. What, what becomes of religion in the post-human age? Okay. Well, we will link to those books. And, uh, and thanks so much for taking the time. Well, thank you very much for your questions and uh, for your interest in what I'm doing. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested than ever. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.